So, we will be dealing with this uh, primary waste water, waste water treatment techniques that we would start now, but before that let me tell you, you know we would not generally discuss much about the screening and filtration part because you know this is the very basic part I have said, but this is uh, there is the method of screening, screening method of communication that I will not discuss mostly, but we will start with the primary treatment techniques. At this juncture, you know, it is pretty important for all of us to understand the difference between the, the what is the expectation about the water. Suppose this water is coming out from a source, any source, say coming out from an industry, coming out from a sewage pump, coming out from a, a typical uh, uh, say the, a process like you know, is something like food processing waste. What are the expectations of the water? I mean, having seen the water or coming out of a particular industry or a process, we should try to understand what we should expect in that water. Say in a food processing waste water would have high BOD, essentially it would have high BOD, but it will have less say uh, inorganic TDS, less inorganic TDS, may have some salt may have in that less on inorganic TDS. So, here but on the other hand say a mine waste, mining related waste water or say waste water where there are only the substances, the mixer, mixing substances are of inorganic nature, we would only observe inorganic salts present in that. So, in the most of this mining waste water, acid mine drainage or whatever we discuss about, we will deal with that also acid mine drainage and all this. We generally observe the water to be of a certain characteristics. The characteristics is initially whenever it is whenever wherever it is getting produced there will be the the environment would be oxygen deficient this is number one the st the second point that we would observe in such cases is there would be uh, no uh, very little bod because mining as such the process does not create any place for bod to be produced so what we would find is this would be high tss high tds but this high tds was basically due to inorganic content, inorganic contents of different kinds of metal cations and anions. Okay. So, having said this, so now if you can make it is important to differentiate between industrial and sewage or uh, civic wastewater, though largely, large you know most of the wastewater engineering today is mostly that this part of wastewater engineering is highly developed, is quite well developed civic and town wastewater treatment methods but industrial wastewater treatment is still in the process of development. There is lot of things still required, a lot of uh, research inputs are still important. And so, what we find is an industrial wastewater may or may not contain as I have said industrial wastewater may not may or may not contain high BOD, right. It may not contain high BOD, it is not as it is a some industry like you know sugar cane waste, sugar cane industry or sugar industry, there may be high BOD, but not in all say you know like a process a, a chemical uh, process like you know mineral processing, the waste cannot have high BOD, mineral processing the waste will not have high BOD, say similarly a, a, a pro method where you know say sulfuric acid is produced, a chemical plant or a particular any other chemical being produced. Here, there you will not find high BOD, the BOD would not be important parameter there. Though we measure BOD, but you know it is not maybe may, on, may not contain, mostly may not contain high BOD. Say this this mostly uh, the, uh, the there would be less uh, say less uh, uh, organic material. But they would be mostly you know oxygen deficiency, oxygen depleted, they would be mostly oxygen depleted and the finally, the most important part would be they would be having enriched metal cations and, um, and sulphate, carbonate, bicarbonate. Okay. So, this is industrial wastewater, but say civic wastewater on the other hand, civic or sewage wastewater, wastewater is 
civic waste water on the other hand will be necessarily high BOD say less organic matter I mean comparatively less comparatively less organic material it would also be oxygen depleted there be it will be deficient in oxygen you may or may not accept some of these metal cations and sulfates etcetera. Another very important thing here is high in nitrogen, high ammoniacal nitrogen, nitrogen, high ammoniacal nitrogen. So, this is the difference. So, you can see depending on this process, depending on this purposes, the total treatment method would be different treatment methods would be different, but nonetheless you know there are several methods you know which are uh, true for say civic and wastewater treatment. We will deal with them because just to ex, um, explain you what are the basic principles of the treatment, what we would really like to uh, attach with this. The one very important thing is a trickling filter. Trickling filter this is where we are dealing with the primary treatment techniques this uh, trickling filter the trickling filter is like this what is what is generally done in a trickling filter is uh, like this this is particularly what is this influent is entering into the column like this here you can see it is nothing like you know what you observe in a uh, in a, a bathroom spray or things like that the water goes and sprays okay yeah it's a, like a fountain or a spray like that you can see here this would be the sprays you know here would be the the the, the perforations would be there 
through which this water would be passed into this uh, part particularly this one is it is a packed packed granulated rock packed granulated rock or it can sometimes we are using nowadays you know say geolites also geolite beds geolites or even polymers also is polymer synthetic polymers synthetic polymers are being used what is this they do is you see here the water finally is the most important part here is to understand his that you know this water finally forming like this you know traveling across this different uh, pebble surfaces, the rock surfaces and then finally coming out from the bottom, finally coming out from the bottom. So, you know here this water trickling from here and things like that you know as soon as this the two, two purposes are served, two purposes the water begins to trickle through this, through this granulated rock or geolites or synthetic polymers packed with that. And two things the two things are achieved one is you know the reduced velocity reduced velocity so increased increased sedimentation hmm. increased aeration increased aeration it also means you know increased increased settlement of a both increased settlement of a organic and inorganic substances inorganic inorganic and organic substances So, you can see this you know this is particularly so after having coming from there you know through this chamber through this channel this water that would be collected here this water that would be collected here would be generally taken out would be taken out through through the ports here. So, this is what would be you can see this water coming going out through an effluent like this. through an effluent like this. Okay. So, here this water is going out as an effluent from the chamber, from the chamber, from the chamber. So, you can see if you just try to observe from a uh, from a plan, you just this across say in about if you just make a section along this line around this x x x x dashed if you make a section, what you observe is that there would be there would be small perforation on this surfaces small perforations the small perforations on this on them the small perforations that we see generally in all surfaces of this nature so through which the water would be allowed to pass and small perforations should be there and on top of that on top of that you will find this this the pebbles settle like this. So, here if you see this you know in a section like this. So, water trickling through these surfaces through these surfaces at a much reduced velocity at a much reduced velocity would essentially go down like this and as a result of which there would be the in the surfaces in the surfaces we will find the in the surfaces due to the natural process due to natural processes the the sediments the sediments would be collected. So, these sediments need to be regularly cleaned for the effective use of this substances. 
So here two important things are important two important two important things have to be noted here. There is the increase in the area of contact, slowing of velocity, increased duration, all leading to increased sedimentation of different substances, inorganic and organic of both of both nature, both inorganic and organic, isn't it? So this is what this is how this surface is. If you just see this, this is across even if you do not see the full part of it, if you just make a section instead of this x, x, x dash here of this section, it would look like this. I have not in a if x exaggerated, I have not drawn this. So, I am just trying to limit to this particular part, here it would be looking like this. So, here this is a trickling filter. So, this is a very interesting and very typical type of water treatment method. Much of this, I tell you one thing, still today, much of this can be achieved. A great amount of water filtration is can be achieved if this kind of small, typical, very simple systems are very effectively used. I can tell you to it uh, all, I mean, all my understanding about the subject is the earthen filters that we used to see, you know, you know, in, in our childhood, you know, even say in my childhood especially, say, you know, in cases like that, they are as effective as many of the water mechanical or electronic filters that we have observed today. They are equally effective. Only most important thing is that has to be maintained. You do not expect that the, the, that this would be set up for in countries like ours, the problem is we set up a plant and then forget about it. We do not really do not make much effort to maintain it. If we maintain it, this can itself serve a lot of great purposes. They can be as effective as secondary treatment methods. So, here this is about a trickling filter. As another very important part is you know is uh, that is generally is called is a rotating biological contactor. Rotating biological contactor, rotating biological contactor. Let me make a drawing first. This is how it looks like. You will find this you know in the textbook also you know you will find this drawing here, but try to do the drawing I will mean, I will make some changes in the drawing because of okay, it should be should be like this and then this. Okay. Okay. Don't break this. All right. So here, this one is how it is going. Like, is this? Sorry, here. This would be an opening there. This would be an opening there also. Oh, okay. So you see this. This is what is you know. This is what is where this is. Primary settling is taking place. Uh, primary settling. Primary settling, taking place. 
you can see this primary settling tank you can generally take it out right this is what is a rotating biological contactor you know is a is a rotating biological contactor let me explain how it is is basically if you just observe it it would be it would be like this these are basically rotating discs rotating discs of these rotating discs you know if you just observe this thing like this So, you can see this, this is this is how they would look from one view or else you can see it like this, you know they would be like All right. You see this. This is uh, this is how the tank is, on which there would be water. On which there would be water coming out, going out like this, coming in and going out like this. So here, the water would enter. This is how the water would enter, and this is this would be. They would be connected. You know, this is this is. These are called rotating because they rotate either powered or with the flow of the water rotating biological contactor rotating biological contactor so what happening is as i have said this oxygen oxygen this is this water is o2 deficient o2 deficient so the reaction rate drops down reaction rate drops down to a substantial amount. So, the reaction rate actually comes down. So, it to increase the reaction rate, to increase the reaction rate, it is an important thing, it is essential. It is essential that we increase the concentration of oxygen in the water. And this can only be possible, you know, where we are just allowing some of the water in turn, you know, in the, in the process of a wheel to come in contact with the air and as a result of which increased aeration taking place. This is this is a this is a typical uh, biological uh, rotating biological contactor there would be three streams or four streams like this then it would finally go into a secondary settling tank. So, you can see this in this in the secondary settling tank this is what is a secondary settling tank settling tank. What is another important interesting thing that takes place here is on another is basically this is called activated sludge, activated sludge, this activated sludge is generally sent back here. Some of these sludges that would be create uh, some of the sludges that would be uh, produced here, some of the sludges that would be produced here see the sludge that would be produced here selectively, selectively it would be brought back and would be supplied into this water. The reason is very simple. The reason is you know this water the microbial activity in this water would be much less because this is a fresh wastewater stream. Uh, whereas, on the other hand here this is completely enriched with microbes, large number of microbes are present already there. So, this microbes 
would be generally put into this stream back, back to this stream again. And as a result of which, you know, the oxidation, the reaction process would increase. It is something like you have seen the preparation of card at home. What do they do is, you know, the card, you know, part of the card would be left, uh, kept aside and would be mixed with the milk. And so, that the, the process of uh, the carding takes place. Okay? The same thing takes place here. The same situation is here also. What is, what we are skipping? We are essentially keeping something with lot of microbes. The microbes that would be actually transfer the milk into a card. This is a typical microbial action, very simple microbial action. You see this, the total characteristics of this, the milk would get changed. And this is completely microbially controlled, a complete microbial action taking place. To control this microbial action sometimes, what we require is to do it fast, to do it in a controlled manner, to do it in a controlled manner some of these microbes, the preferred microbes or you know uh, something, uh, some of those microbes which would be found in the waste of the sludge of, sludge of this secondary settling tank would be reverted back to the primary settling tank again. Okay. So, as a result of which this, the process of, in this process, the, um, uh, this thing, uh, the uh, decomposition of the organic waste and also different chemical precipitation method also can be applied. A large part of that would also be involved in the chemical precipitation methods. Chemical precipitation would also take place. Two is, one is that the, the two purposes of this is that you know need to, this is biological, uh, biological action for treatment of high BOD wastewater. It also helps, helps in, helps in increased precipitation, helps in increased precipitation have seen increased precipitation. This is another very important part. Biological action, biological action for treatment of high BOD wastewater. There is a purpose of using this rotating biological contactor. Helps in increased precipitation. Also helps in increased precipitation of say hydroxides, hydroxides, then you can say sulphides, sulphates. Okay. Ideally, a ideally a met, ideally a process suitable for ideally a process suitable for civic wastewater, but this one can also be used for the purpose of increased sedimentation of say a number of inorganic chemicals, near number of inorganic substances. Okay. So, it serves two ways, it serves two ways, this is called a rotating biological contactor. This rotating biological contactors are also in great use, you know, is a various purposes they are generally used, uh, particularly they, they are also another important part is in a combined treatment, you know, where combined treatment, you know, in some cases this this uh, rotating biological contractor or trickling filter may be combined with a principal treatment technique so that to augment the process to augment the process we would require that to to speed up the process it is required some kind of pre treatment is required of the waste pre treatment so these are basically very fun, good pre treatment methods where we are trying to before the final settlement takes place we are trying to pre-treat the, uh, the, uh, the waste material, pre-treat the waste material in water, so that they become more attuned to sedimentation at the later stage. We will see in a particularly in organic treatment, this kind of situations or this kind of techniques are very, very important. I mean a pre-treatment, cases for pre-treatment can be used. 
another very typical I mean uh, if you are not doing any kind of uh, wastewater treatment the essential very essential part is you know in many cases in your households or wherever if you are just trying to use if you are in you are thinking of using a, a generally polluted water for some purposes say irrigation or say for um, say uh, say something like you know at least uh, feeding the uh, uh, livestock cows and buffaloes and things like that one very important method of treatment technique process is oxidation pond treatment oxidation pond the particularly of great importance to countries like ours where we should have an oxidation pond what is an oxidation pond this is in an oxidation pond is you know largely say the influent influent would be would be generally sent into is most ideally is most ideal is the earthen tank tanks the earthen tanks which are generally shallow very shallow in this earthen tanks you can see this them as very shallow shallow earthen tanks although sometimes this the affluent height of the affluent and this height this is mostly the same so here this is this depth is 0 0.3 to say about 0 0.4 meter or say about 30 centimeter to 40 centimeter here as this one can be as as we as width as possible you know this is not necessary that this one can be as long as possible sometimes you know it is better <coughs> between 500 meters 500 meters or say 500 meters to it can be up to 1 kilometer so this is typical wetland you know if you have seen the wetlands wetlands typical wetlands where there is a a very small width of the water the depth of the water is very small this particular surface you can see this this particular surface say here the water is being dumped here this is this is either brick or clay clay is favored clay construction this is basically an earthen construction you can see this this one would be 500 into 500 say 25 uh, say 500 into 500 so 500 into 500 say meter square so you know you can see this meter so it is about say 25 into 0 0 0 the square meter of width square meter of area very wide very wide but very shallow also what happens we generally do is we say this effluent water if you just allow the effluent water this can be this particularly this is you know this is this particular area is a catchment area this can be a, a say river catchment river catchment area which is which would be suitable for an oxidation treatment like this what is what we are trying to do is here there will be it would be you know a good supply of sunlight a good supply of sunlight we would observe that you know initially is basically till we observe say about 1 to 0.1 to 0 0.1 to 0 0.1 to 5 meter we observe mostly a good oxidation uh, say aerobic column aerobic column and particularly below this particularly below this up to a certain depth after a certain depth say between say point 0 0.2 to say 0 0.25 0. Point, say 0 0.25 to 0 0.4 this depth at this depth we find an aerobic anaerobic column
depending on on the load of the waste the load of the waste depending on the load of the waste we find that the about this you know in this about this column there would be an aerobic column there would be an anaerobic column what would happen is in the aerobic column in the aerobic column what we find is as i have said mostly you know in an uh, say say sunlight and then aerobic microorganisms aerobic microorganisms you will find co2 you will find uh, h2o then you will find say um, co2 h2o mostly and stable compounds stable compounds uh, several stable compounds you will also find some h2s here you will also find some nitrogen say in the form of say NO2 or say in the form of NOx. Okay. On the other hand in this anaerobic column if you see column C H O say N N or any other substances P H for P phosphorus all these substances connected connected with reduced oxygen with reduced oxygen sufficient oxygen here reduced oxygen here you would find that under reduced oxygen reduced sunlight reduced or no sunlight reduced or no sunlight anaerobic microorganisms anaerobic microorganisms anaerobic microorganisms we will find carbon monoxide we will mine carbon monoxide we will find water we will find some h2s also here mostly h2s you will find you know some kind of methane also being produced methane and you will find uh, say unstable compounds other unstable and ordinary compounds odorous compounds so you know here in this anaerobic column you can find this apart from this you know there would be many uh, many things to deal with this inorganic components also a large part of inorganic substances like you know say um, iron uh, say here in case you can also observe another important reactions taking place in this column itself we will find that fe3 plus with say with say increased increased uh, say increased uh, finding FUH3 which would be settling we would also observe that ferric hydroxide deposition taking place ferric hydroxide deposition taking place so this is also known as an oxygen this is a suddenly reducing reducing tds so reducing tds so you can see this is the part in oxygen pond so this is this oxygen pond generally helps us to obtain so these are the purposes these are the typical these are very simple type of very simple type of uh, the primary treatment methods that we generally use this primary treatment methods you see that we have not used any material we have generally used we have just generally encouraging the natural reactions to take place and as a result of which you know without much cost without much cost we are able to reduce the concentration of pollutants in the water reducing the concentration of pollutants in the water is a major significant step because by that time you know if you are reducing the concentration of several substances in water the reactivity of the remaining substances increase 
So, that is how you know it generally serves a purpose in doing in carrying out with a method this kind of methods to treat water and initially mostly when you are trying to do you know is a initial processes this particularly this kind of methods generally help. We will continue the discussion here, we will continue the discussion you know and the next class we will still discuss on the different other methods all right ok. Any question? Depending on the standards that you meet, suppose you know there are three kinds of you know you say say in water generally what we are say that the varieties are like this. Say uh, water, water treated with treated water, there are different purposes for use. Say the first level is say for aesthetic use, aesthetic, aesthetic purpose. Say you know when we are when we are trying to do say in a park or we are using in a pond. So, you want the water to be clear, so that you know people generally get drawn to this. But that water is not essentially drinkable water, you do not expect that to be drinkable water. This kind of particularly this is aesthetic purposes that is also for that also in many treatment ok, not only for drinking. The next comes is industrial water. say hardness, reducing hardness is an important part of industrial water. In industrial water we should have hardness very little because you know hardness increases the carbonation process inside there will be many kind of difficulties that arise out of this processes. So, you know the after aesthetic purpose the industrial water that we use for industrial purposes. Next come comes is the drinking water. So, may be in many cases, may be in many cases the primary treatment method may not be sufficient for to make the water uh, good for drinking, but you know the secondary treatment may be required, a tertiary treatment may be required for this to make it sufficiently potable water. That we will see later you know where we can use. The water that we have said in most cases these are used for aesthetic purposes and industrial water. They are not still good for drinking water. In drinking water we require certain other requirements also, we will deal with this, we will discuss with them drinking water. So, all right. So, this is how you know we will see there later on ok. A young nation aspiring to find ways to fulfill a dream lays the foundation of an institution that will give aspiring technocrats the license to fly high. The first Indian Institute of Technology is born at Kharagpur. Founded on the basis of the recommendations of the NR Sarkar committee that was set up in 1945 to consider the development of higher technical institutions in India, the institute was first established in 5 Esplanade East, Kolkata, before it moved to Kharagpur in 1951. With Sir Gyan Chandra Ghosh as the first director and Dr. B.C. Roy as one of its founding guardians, the institute established itself as the symbol of a young, dynamic and resurgent nation. As top students rub shoulders with the most celebrated of professors and scholars, visions took shape. And IIT Kharagpur continued to play the pioneering role that was envisaged for it, enabling India to become a knowledge powerhouse that it is today.
stage of its evolution, IIT Kharagpur remained ahead of its times. It provided the best of facilities for the budding technologists, helping them shape their own as well as the nation's future. Indeed, today IIT Kharagpur has blossomed into a time-tested, venerable institute of learning with the rich experience of converting individuals into brilliant professionals through 50 glorious years. As you cross the campus gate, you feel the distinct nip that is IIT Kharagpur. The spirit of objective inquiry and lateral thinking hangs heavy in the air. The modern township-like campus of IIT Kharagpur, set in sylvan surroundings, is self-sufficient in all respects. At IIT Kharagpur, lush green bowers of tranquility coexist with smart cards and ATMs. Spread over 690 hectares of sprawling cyber habitat, 120 kilometers from Kolkata, IIT Kharagpur is one of the largest network campuses in Asia. Just the academic complexes itself spreads over a built-up area of about 2 million square feet, of which 150,000 square feet is the new complex that commemorates the Golden Jubilee celebrations. And that's not all. It is the only IIT to have conquered territory beyond its own through cutting-edge courses offered in its extension campuses at Kolkata and Bhubaneswar. IIT Kharagpur is not just about its large campus, but its diverse range of activities. It offers the widest spectrum of disciplines ranging from aerospace, biotechnology, cryogenics, to architecture, mining and agricultural engineering, supported by strong faculties of sciences, humanities and management. There are more than 30 departments and centers that offer the largest number of undergraduate and postgraduate courses amongst the IITs. The courses are ever evolving and show the way for other sister institutions. The richness in its diverse activities is showcased by the technological support the institution provides in areas like architecture, agriculture, post-harvest technology and medical sciences. The institute has revolutionized and popularized rice milling technology. The other major contributions of IIT Kharagpur have been in the critical fields of defense, railways, space research, power systems and petrochemicals. All these activities directly empower the human requirements of the nation. Advanced facilities at the Institute make it possible to undertake cutting-edge research and service-sponsored research projects. The array of equipment ranges from aerodynamic testing laboratories to intelligent machining centers, atomic spectrometers, to VLSI design labs, molecular beam epitaxy, to anechoic chamber, fast protein liquid chromatographs to liquid nitrogen plants. The Institute Library deserves a special mention. 
fully web enabled, it is one of the largest in Asia with over 324,000 volumes of material, including books, videos, microfilm, and patent documents. that ensure a student's mind develops at the right pace. Along with its strong sense of academics, which is ensured by a strict selection process, life at Kharagpur is a celebration of, well, life. And at its heart are the students. In fact, the saying goes that you can take an IITN out of KGP, but not KGP out of an IITN. You've left a part of you behind. For most of the students, life in the campus was in itself a festivity, a collage of activities that shape their mind and body. A collage of events that was a synthesis of competition and cooperation. A collage of interests as diverse as traumatics and ham radio. Yes, life at Kharagpur has always been exciting. And the years cemented lifelong bonds as lives mingled over cups of joy and stretched over stimulating semesters. The halls with their blocks and wings connected by charming catwalks remain ensconced in their own world. A collage of memories. Infrastructurally adequate, architecturally meticulate, and holistically inspiring. Where students, wherever they might be from, invariably come into their own, developing their individual talents honing their skills to take on challenges with confidence so they can move ahead in fulfilling their dreams. What makes IIT Kharagpur so unique is its environment. Undiluted by the diversions of metropolitan surroundings, the close-knit campus life enhances the entrepreneurial and innovative spirit of the achievers to be. In an environment that is so stimulating, it is only natural that down the years, IIT Kharagpur has consistently produced well-rounded individuals. Many of them are celebrities in their own right. Holistic grooming has had a lot to do with this. So, no matter which walk of life they choose, the IIT KGPite stands tall. And so does the institution that bred him in majestic splendor. The alumni of this institute command global respect. Their distinguished presence at the helm of global giants is a matter of national pride. For the students of IIT Kharagpur, it is impossible to erase any scratch of memory about their alma mater. In fact, some come back to invest sentiment, pride, and money. To see the institute they call home rise to even greater heights, structurally, functionally, as well as holistically. Their singular aim is to make IIT Kharagpur an institute whichever way you look at it par excellence.
A man's journey into quiet accomplishment and the Hall of Fame starts with the right step. And the training and placement cell of IIT has been the efficient facilitator in this regard for over 30,000 graduates. Having placed more than 95% of its students in a wide range of industries consistently for over two decades, it is no wonder that the Institute is the most preferred campus for technical recruitment of quality manpower. With infrastructure like industrial power and communication facilities, in addition to its excellent research and consultancy facilities, STEP or Science and Technology Entrepreneurs Park aims to assist the budding entrepreneur into a successful adventure capitalist, guiding him right from the concept, institutional financing, production, leading up to the launch and marketing of the product. With its rich pool of talent and excellent infrastructure, it is no surprise that through the last three decades, IIT Kharagpur has developed strong liaison with the industry. SRIC, or Sponsored Research and Industrial Consultancy Cell, was formalized as the Special Industry Interaction Cell in 1982. Devoted full-time to handle industrial projects and consultancies and for deploying and propagating intellectual property. Successful sponsored research projects straddle a wide spectrum, ranging from computers, communication and biotechnology to robotics, photonics and food processing. The setting up of a state-of-the-art VLSI CAD laboratory and tie-ups with GE in areas ranging from vehicle structure design to electrical communication and software technologies are excellent examples of IIT Kharagpur's ever-evolving pioneering spirit. Collaborations with a host of national and industrial majors are a testimony of its proven expertise and research repertoire. celebration continues, Pandit Nehru would surely have been a proud man today. For him, IIT Kharagpur was always more than just an institute of technology. In his own immortal words, it is indeed a fine monument of modern India. <laughs> 